Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IS. Today in this session we are going to have a discussion on the newspaper of 12th of April 2024. So let's begin with the list of articles first. For detailed analysis we have these two articles today. A battle to save Ladakh and all of humanity. This is in your editorial page. And then on the science page, the last page, you have something called as Next Car 19. So we'll discuss about what is Next Car 19 in the context of cancer treatment. Something that has been in the news for quite a while. So that's why it's a very, very important topic. And then from the prelims perspective, first two articles related to what ADB has said and projects India's first is about India's GDP growth and second with regard to US interest rates. And then lastly, ISRO's zero orbital debris milestone. So these are the three articles from the prelims perspective that we are going to discuss in today's lecture. So let's begin with the first article which we have on your editorial page, a battle to save Ladakh and all of humanity. Now when it comes to this article, this article basically talks about or in the context of the uh, the protest that we have seen in Ladakh which has been led by Sonam Vanchuk who has been a recipient of the prestigious Raman Maxese award for his contributions to society and he addressed a crowd of almost 30,000 people in Leh and this is where he announced a 21 day climate fast. Now his message went beyond the local population and this is something that serves as a global appeal for climate action. Now the Himalayan region which is very often also referred to as the third pole, it also contains approximately 15,000 glaciers which become very very crucial. So, so what we know is that when it comes to Ladakh uh, or in general when it comes to the Himalayas, we know that Himalayas have more than 15,000 glaciers, more than 15,000 glaciers and these are very very crucial for the region's hydrology supplying water to the rivers like the Indus, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra and then these glaciers they we know are at a risk of melting due to global warming. Now this is something which can have very severe consequences for both the mountain communities and also for the people who are living downstream. Now in this context, <coughs> sorry, in this context, the article also talks about the national mission for sustaining the Himalayan ecosystem. Now this is basically an initiative that was launched under the national action plan on climate change. The main objective here was to scientifically assess the vulnerability of the Himalayan region to the climate change and continuous monitoring of the health status of the Himalayan ecosystem. Now it becomes very very crucial so that's why just remember that when it comes to this mission what exactly this mission is about this basically the mission is about a scientific assessment scientific assessment of the Himalayan Himalayan vulnerability to climate change. All right, to climate change. Now, in this particular regard, when it comes to what it starts, it wants to do, the aim basically is to address the environmental challenges that are faced by the Himalayan regions, such as the loss of glaciers, the biodiversity loss, the natural disasters, so all these things. And <coughs> this can be done, sorry, this can be done by promoting sustainable development practices and enhancing the resilience of the local communities. Now, in this regard, that's why some of the important issues that the policy or the mission wants to address. This is uh, a screenshot that I've taken from the policy document itself. So the policy document says that these are the five important things. Himalayan glaciers and the associated hydrological consequences, the biodiversity conservation and protection, wildlife conservation and protection, traditional knowledge societies and their livelihood and planning for sustaining of the Himalayan ecosystem. So these are the primary 
issues that are being addressed as per the report. So we know that there are a lot of issues, whether it is melting of the glaciers or biodiversity loss, the natural disasters, all these things have to be understood and this is where we need to enhance the resilience of the local communities. And that's why it also tries to uh, coordinate between the research, uh, the conservation efforts and the policy interventions to ensure a long term sustainability of the Himalayan ecosystem. And at the same time, it also tries to take into account the socio-economic needs of the region's inhabitants. Now, overall, you have to understand that this is where the article says that despite, despite initiatives like this particular mission, which is aimed to ass uh, assess the region's vulnerability to climate change, Ladakh has witnessed a surge in mega infrastructure projects since becoming a union territory. Now, these kind of projects, there are multiple different types of projects. There are multiple different types of projects that we today see uh, are being taken up in this particular regard. So, whether it is the construction of the uh, construction projects, like let's say construction of the bridges, the roads, the tunnels, the railway lines, and all the large scale energy projects like solar energy projects or uh, geothermal energy projects. These are all aimed at boosting tourism and economic development of this particular region. And in this regard, we see that the Border Roads Organization and the National Highways and Infrastructure Development Corporation, they have been spearheading a, a lot of these projects. And they have been driven by a vision to accelerate infrastructure development in some of the strategic areas like Ladakh. But at the same time, when it comes to the rapid pace of development, it raises a concern about the environmental impact and the lack of uh, consideration for the climate change related risks. So that's why the region, we have to understand that we and we have been seeing this for at least past one decade or so, that the region has already experienced very severe several disasters. When you go back to the unfortunate uh, cloud burst that happened back in 2013 that led to flash floods in Kedarnath which claimed thousands of lives and despite warning despite warnings from the experts infrastructure projects they continue unabated and this is something that also puts both the lives of the workers and the residents at risk and climate change activists they also have been frustrated by the lack of action and the adherence to safety measures in these kind of projects. And despite approaching the courts and various different expert committees, they really do not have a, a solution yet. And that's why they have been emphasizing on the importance of protecting the fragile Himalayan ecosystem and the biodiversity from the well-being of the current and the, for the well-being of the current and the future generations. So that's why when it comes to this kind of an activism, this is something that is for us, it is uh, uh, very important to understand not in the context of just about Ladakh, but it is something that represents a very large battle for humanity and the preservation of the planet's ecosystem. And that's why it talks about the urgent need that we have for sustainable development practices and to have a collective action to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And overall, when you look at the Himalayan ecosystem, you have to understand the vulnerability of the Himalayan ecosystem. We know that this is an area which is vulnerable to climate change because there are so many thousands of glaciers and we see that glaciers are receding, the glaciers are melting at a faster pace and at the same time there have been changes in the weather pattern as well. And because of the weather pattern changes also, we see that there are erratic snowfalls sometimes and if let's say timely snowfalls do not happen then it also means that all the rain or all the uh, rivers of the Gangetic Plains and the, uh, the Indian Plains that we have there also there will not be enough water and if there is no in not enough water it will also impact agriculture in all these areas and these are areas which are very heavily dependent on the Himalayan waters, on the uh, waters that are coming from the melting of the glaciers. So that's why we have to understand that it's not only about a fight of the local community there. Of course, they are going to be the ones who are going to face the challenge a lot more than others. But at the same time, it will have a complete negative impact on the Indian economy as well. And it's not going to be something which is just a localized problem. 
so that's why from this perspective we have to understand these aspects of where the things are going wrong because yes development is necessary but we have to take a very measured approach especially in the areas which are fragile we have seen so many of these problems in Uttarakhand we have seen so many of these problems in Himachal and now in case of Ladakh also we see an impending problem like this so that's why these are the areas where we have to take a step the government also has to realize its role and accordingly we have to move forward instead of just thinking about how economic development of a certain small region can happen because that economic development might be good but at the same time it will have a very large repercussion for the entire economy which probably we are not uh, right now able to understand so that's why these are the things that we need to understand from the perspective of this article Coming to the next article, Crafted at Home, Next Car 19 takes India to the next level in cancer care. Now this is something that we have at the last page, that is the science page in today's article, uh, in today's newspaper. Now to start with, first and foremost, it talks about something which is called as the CAR T therapy. Now this CAR T therapy has been in the news for very long time. All right, and since 2017 at least you can say that it has constantly been in the news a question hasn't been asked yet so that's why you have to understand that questions can come from this particular area because this is constantly in the news every year it will be in the news at least thrice or four times to five times in the newspapers various newspapers whether in the Hindu or the Indian Express or any other newspaper that you read so that's why from that perspective if we are looking at your examination I would say that this is a very very important article and this is a very very important topic both for your prelims and your mains examination. Now what is this CAR T, CAR -T cell therapy? Just try to understand this. So first thing what do we do in this particular uh, therapy is that first we collect T cells. The first step basically involves collecting blood from the patient. Right? Blood will be taken from the patient and this blood is processed to collect T cells. What are T cells? T cells basically are a kind of white blood cells that play a very critical role in the immune system. All right? T cells play a very very important role because T cells will be the one that will try to destroy the antigens that are entering the body. All right? So first thing is about the T cells. So T cells basically help in maintaining the immunity maintaining the immunity in in the body and they can kill the antigens what are antigens antigens are basically anything that is unwanted for our body any bacteria any virus any toxin that has entered our body and could be seen as uh, dangerous by our immune system that will be killed with the help of T cells. So that's why T cells help in maintaining the immunity. So what do we do first thing in this entire process? We remove the blood from patient to get the T cells. All right. The first cell, the, this is the first step. Now, in this particular scenario, what we then see is that there is a genetic modification that will happen that once the T cells are collected, they are sent to a lab where they will undergo a genetic modification process. And in this step, the T cells, they are engineered to produce specific structures on their surface which are called as chimeric antigen receptors or CARs. Now these receptors, they enable the T cells to recognize and attack the cancer cells. So, so this is basically what is done here that you have this T cell and in this T cell, we will be in inserting a gene for this particular car. So what exactly are we doing? The T cells basically are engineered so that we can produce very specific structure on their surface and these are called as CARs or chimeric, uh, chimeric antigen receptors. Now these receptors they will enable the T cells to recognize and attack the cancer cells. All right? So this is the importance of the CARs. What will CARs do? They, what will cars do? Just understand that that they will enable. They will enable. Uh, basically, they will enable the T cells 
uh, enable the T cells to recognize and attack the cancer antigens just remember that they will attack the cancer cells all right recognize and attack the cancer cells now in this uh, after this process we see that after this modification these car t cells they are grown in the lab until they multiply into millions of cells and this is a process that can actually take a couple of weeks time so CAR T cells basically are grown until there are millions of these CAR T cells which are available with us. All right. As you can see in this process that we grow millions of CAR T cells in the lab. Now once enough CAR T cells are produced, they are infused back into the patient's bloodstream. And this is something that is usually done through an IV similar to how a blood transfusion happens. So similar to that, we will see that this will be infused back into the patient. Now, once these newly infused CAR T cells travel through the body, they would be able to find and kill the cancer cells. And these engineered cells, they basically are specially trained to recognize and attack the patient's specific cancer cells. Now, after this infusion, we also see that the uh, doctors will closely keep on monitoring the patient for any signs of side effects or if they see, uh, they'll try to see how well the treatment is working. And this monitoring continues for weeks to even months because the CAR T cells can remain active in the body for a very long time. So this is what exactly the process is that once. So as you can see that once these CAR T cells, they enter the body, they will be able to attack these cancer cells they will be able to attack these cancer cells and kill these cancer cells so this is ultimately what we see in this particular CAR T therapy now this article talks about not just CAR T therapy but it talks about something called as the next CAR 19 now what is next CAR 19 now when it comes to this CAR T therapy the one that we just discussed this is a very costly treatment the treatment uh, the, of the CAR T therapy can cost up to rupees 4 crore rupees all right up to rupees 4 crores so that's why it's a very very costly treatment and you can say almost impossible for majority of the people especially let's say if we are talking the context of India to afford this kind of a treatment now this is where we see that back in 2015 and this is where the story starts of what the uh, article says that back in 2015 Alka Dvivedi she embarked on a journey uh, on a mission to develop patient centered therapy for cancer and in this particular scenario we see that she also collaborated with Rahul Purwar uh, who has been a professor at IIT Bombay and they wanted to make this CAR T uh, therapy affordable in India. Now, in this context, when it comes to CAR T therapy, we know what CAR T therapy is. Now, in this, what we see is that once uh, Dr. Purwar, for example, he completed his uh, postdoctorate program from the Harvard Medical School, and then he returned to ba returned back to India in 2013, and then he started working on making this therapy uh, cost effective for a lot of people here. Now, when it comes to this CAR T therapy and how exactly they started working on it, we see that first and foremost, uh, they wanted to make it affordable and that's why they made certain modifications. Now, in making this modification, they have made modifications in these CAR cells. Now, for example, when it comes to this uh, next CAR 19, which has been developed in India, it differs from the US therapies. Uh, in the manner how it has been able to humanize the CAR composition. Because when it comes to these CAR cells uh, in, in CAR T cell therapy, what happens is that there, so, so what we are saying is that this basically is where we are making changes where uh, instead of using the cells that were taken from the mice, which was the case in the CAR T therapy, 
in this case what we see is that we take the same cells from the human body itself all right from the human body itself this is a major change that they have done instead of taking the cells from the mice that has been taken from uh, in in the car t therapy the modified form of this car t therapy which is the next car 19 developed in india this is where we see that this is a humanized car composition and that's why it potentially also reduces the toxicity that's why it also potentially can reduce toxicity it can reduce toxicity in the human body so that's why uh, when it comes to CAR T therapy for example we know that it also comes with its risks including some of the side effects like uh, CRS for example is one of the side effects that we have so there are these side effects and there are chances of neurotoxicity as well but at the same time when it comes to let's say when you talk about in the context of India the access to primary health care remains a challenge in India and that's why these therapies side effects necessitates a proximity to hospital as well now in case of next car 19 we have been able to make it more affordable but the cost still remains very high because the cost still remains in in the range of 30 to 40 lakhs of course it's drastically down almost 90 percent lesser uh, as compared to the original car t therapy but still 30 to 40 lakh rupees is not something which is easily affordable for a lot of people in the country and that's why efforts are underway to further reduce the cost through maybe scaling up of the manufacturing and improving upon the purchasing power and additionally the therapy's low toxicity also means that there will be reduced hospitalization cost for the patient so that's why that also has to be understood Although the challenges that remain in managing the side effects and ensuring the equitable access to the treatment, they remain. But at the same time, we have to understand that when it comes to the CAR T therapy, uh, apart from the 3-4 crore rupees that one has to spend on the therapy, the chances of side effects are also high. And that's why in those cases, the hospitalizations and the treatment of the side effects, they can also be very money intensive. So that adds to the total value or, or the total cost of the treatment. Whereas in case of the next car 19, we see that the chances of toxicity are highly reduced and that's why the chances of hospitalization and the further cost after the treatment is done will also be significantly lower. So that's why in this context it becomes cost effective yet not cost effective enough. So that's, that is where you can say the next uh, the next gen of the development is headed now coming to the prelims based articles for the day the first article that we have is on page number one adb projects india's gdp growth in 2024-25 at seven percent now here we are talking about the asian development bank and asian development bank basically has projected that india's gdp growth in 2024-25 will be at seven percent now the asian development bank it basically released its asia development outlook report and this asia development outlook report so it was the asia development outlook report now this report, this report basically, it forecasted India's economic performance over the next two years. Now while India's uh, GDP growth is expected to slow down from 7.6% in uh, the financial year 23-24 to 7% in the current year, it is projected to improve to 7.2% in 2025-26. Uh, so this is basically what they have said, that right now, so it is expected to slow from 7.6 to 7 percent in this year but again improving to 7.2 percent in the next year now the asian development bank it has expected the retail inflation actually to ease and this should come down to 4.5 uh, 4.6 percent this year and 4.5 percent the next year and in this at the same time when it comes to the food inflation inflation food inflation will drop to 5.7% as the farm output return is 
supposed to uh, firm output is supposed to return to its normal trends so this is basically what has been said and at the same time the report also has highlighted that despite a resurgence in inflation in the united states which could delay the uh, uh, anticipated interest rate cuts from the federal reserve and this is something that we'll talk about in the next article as well uh, asia's inflation outlook according to them might be slightly impacted with a similar dent in growth as well now in this context however in case of india what the report has said is that india might experience a more pronounced and persistent impact due to the higher sensitivity to the exchange rate fluctuations and the reliance on the imported goods that india has and additionally a persistent strife in the red sea could also further add to the inflation uh, pressures across the developing uh, nations in asia now at the same time uh, at the same time uh, it also so that's why just remember that higher inflation in the us could impact asia's inflation outlook and india is more sensitive to the exchange rate fluctuations and the reliance on imports and that's why at the same time the red sea crisis the red sea crisis might also add to some of these problems so that's why uh, we have to understand that and then after that what it report also says is that a projected normal monsoon this year is also expected to revive the rural consumption which was subdued last year due to erratic rainfall affected that affected the farm sector and that's why this revival in the rural consumption is indicated by an increased demand for work as well in the manrega scheme so that's why the report emphasized that india's significant role uh, has been uh, also uh, india's significant role in uh, the development of south asia's gdp accounting for almost 80% of the sub region's gdp so that's why india's growth is expected to remain strong and supported by a rising consumption and continued investment growth that is supposed to happen in the country and south asia as a whole is forecasted to grow at 6.3% this year and 6.6% next year so this is basically what has been said uh, as per the report now at the same time one more thing that the report also says is that while uh, higher incomes are expected to boost the consumption demand the urban consumer is uh, the urban consumer confidence levels have actually improved and that is signaling an increase in the demand in the from the urban areas so that's why this is something that has been said that uh, in the context we see that there will be it will be supported by rising consumption investment and improving domestic demand now overall when it comes to uh, so higher income incomes are expected that will uh, lead to more let's say money flowing in the market and that's why there will be more consumption uh, or demand for consumption and that's why we will see that these things will improve however this can actually lead to a rise in imports also to meet the domestic demands and this can potentially widen the current account deficit to up to 1.7% of the gdp this year and the next year so that is where uh, we have to understand from this perspective that let's say if there is an increase in uh, consumption demand so then to meet that consumption demand there might be a lot of imports but this is where the problem lies that in the international trade we might not be able to do good and that might lead to a problem and that's why it can lead to widening of the current def account deficit to up to 1.7 percent of gdp this and the next year now when it comes to india's growth it also has been commented that india's growth will be driven by both public and private sector investment uh, investment demands and at the same time a gradual improvement in the consumer demand as the rural economy also improves so that is also something ha that has been said here that what we might see is that uh, the growth will be the growth that we are talking about it will be driven by both public and private public and private public and private investment demands all right public and private investment demand and at the same time at the same time 
a gradual improvement in the consumer demand as well all right so improvement improvement in consumer demand improvement in consumer demand as well as the rural economy starts to improve and this is where the export growth is also expected to be relatively muted uh, this year due to the slowing growth in major advanced economies but it has been as anticipated to improve in the next year that is 2025-26 and then there are two things that has been uh, also talked about in this report the downside risks and the upside risks the report has identified downside risks to India's economic outlook including the global shock such as let's say spike in the uh, crude oil prices or energy prices that can lead to higher global inflation and tighten the financial conditions altogether and the domestic risk for example underperformance in the agricultural sector due to maybe weather problems or, or, or affecting the demand and the inflation at the same time but when it comes to the upside risk uh, it can also be driven by faster than expected uh, FDI inflows and at the same time particularly into the manufacturing sector which could, Im which could improve the output and productivity uh, at the same time. Additionally, a better than expected global gr growth can also boost the exports and overall growth in the Indian economy. So that's why it talks about uh, uh, that these are the two things that can happen that on the downside uh, if let's say there are spikes in the uh, crude oil prices and underperformance in agriculture due to weather shocks, these can lead to, uh, I mean, uh, worse than what has been expected. But if let's say there are faster than expected FDI inflows and better than expected global growth, it can boost exports and overall growth in the in economy, then the numbers will be better than what has been projected in the report. Now. In the same context, there is this another article that we have, India to face most impact if high US interest rates persist. Now, in this context, understand what do we mean here. There is a term that is being used and very often you will see this term in the newspapers as well. And this is where we are talking about the US Fed rates. You might come across this term specifically a lot in the newspapers and typically if you are an investor in the stock market then in that case you'll hear about these terms even more now this us fed rates it typically refers to the interest rates that are set by the federal reserve which is basically the central banking system of the united states all right so these are what these are the interest rates these are the interest rates all right these are the interest rates that are set by the central banking system of the united states now the primary rate that is set by the fed is called as the federal fund rate which actually is the interest rate at which the depository uh, institutions that is the bank and all the credit unions they lend the reserve balances to all the other depository institutions uh, and in you can say in an uncollateralized uh, manner so in this case what happens is that the rate at which the money is being lent by the depository institutions like the banks and the credit unions so so banks and the credit unions they would lend the money at this particular rate all right and they would basically lend the reserve balance the reserve balance they would lend the reserve balance to all the other depository institutions. Other depository institutions. Now, this, the Federal Reserve basically uses this rate as a tool to manage the economic growth, the inflation and the stability in the financial system. And by adjusting this financial fund rate, the Fed can actually influence the borrowing cost for the banks, for the businesses, for the consumers as well, and thereby it will impact the economic activity in various ways. Now, keep that aside and think of how does it impact India? What happens to India? So, for example, let's say when the US Fed rates increase the rates, all right, 
if let's say rates increase if the rates increase what happens then then what happens is that the US dollar typically will start to strengthen because the investors will seek higher return in the dollar dominated assets and that's why it can lead to a depreciation in the Indian rupee compared to the dollar and a stronger dollar makes imports more expensive for India which can increase the inflationary pressure in India and this is precisely what the report was also talking about correct so when the rates increase just remember this that when the rates increase what happens then is when the rates increase what happens is that the investors will try to go uh, and invest in the dollar dominated assets so it will lead to investments in dollar dominated assets dollar dominated assets and that's why it can lead to depreciation depreciation of the Indian rupee depreciation of the Indian rupee or a depreciation of the Indian rupee and that's why what happens then is because of this it will lead to more expensive imports all right this leads to more expensive imports expensive imports meaning what it will lead to inflation this will lead to inflation in the Indian economy then at the same time uh, higher interest rates in the US can also attract foreign investors to move their investments from emerging markets like India to the US to benefit from higher returns on investment such as the government bonds and other financial instruments and this shift can also lead to a reduction in the capital flows to India and that's why it can affect its stock markets and investment environments altogether as well so that's why when the rates increase what it also leads to is that money is diverted diverted away from emerging economies emerging economies like India all right so that's why it can have a negative impact on the stock market and the investment environment altogether in India and many of the Indian companies they borrow in the US dollars to take the advantage of the lower interest rates abroad compared to the domestic rates so when the US rates rise the cost of serving this debt can also increase and this can also impact the profitability of many of the companies as well so that's why we see that there are a lot of these problems that all of a sudden can happen that uh, even the borrowing rates will be higher and hence for them the margin for profit will start to decrease and the companies will not be performing very well overall so that's why it will lead to a lot of these kind of issues as well so that's why we have to understand that since India is a large for example a large importer of oil higher oil prices can also contribute to inflation which might prompt India's central bank that is the reserve bank of India to also adjust its own monetary policy as well so overall there are a lot of problems then uh, it can also have a negative impact on the trade balance a stronger US dollar could also affect India's trade balance as well and while uh, it makes uh, imports more expensive it makes Indian exports also cheaper for the foreign buyers so that's why it might have some positive impact on sectors like IT and textile so we see that there are all these things and there are there is a very complex interplay that we have but more or less it will have a negative impact on the Indian economy so this is basically what we have seen in in the context of the report so that's why uh, what Asian Development Bank basically has done is it, it basically uh, it has said that uh, uh, the potential impact of higher for longer it talks about the interest uh, impact of higher for longer interest scenario where the US and European central banks delay the anticipated rate cuts beyond 2024 that we are expecting that rate cuts in the Fed rates will happen not only in US but similar to that in Europe as well but that's not happening and it might be delayed further 
and if in that case if that happens it would affect the emerging economies currency growth and the inflation outlooks and that's why we see that there are there can be significant effects of uh, this particular scenario so overall although it can lead to some uh, increase in the exports but overall it can lead to a lot of problems for india so that's why these are the things that have been mentioned in this particular article now coming to our last article this is uh, related to isro's zero orbital debris milestone which is on the text and context page now in this context we are basically talking about a, a particular mission that is the exposat mission so now when it comes to this exposat mission what we see is that the isro recently had lost, uh, launched the exposat mission which is aimed to minimize the space debris by repurposing the final stage of the rocket into an orbital station which is known as POEM3 that is PSLV orbital experimental module 3 now overall when it comes to this we see that what it does is that after successfully deploying all the satellites into the designated orbits the fourth stage of the PSLV was transformed into a POEM3 and then it deorbited to a lower altitude to facilitate its safe re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. And this process along with uh, the passivating of the stage to prevent the explosion significantly reduced the risk of creating any kind of space debris. Now this POEM is basically a, con a concept which has been developed by the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center as a cost effective space platform and it is something that utilizes the sp spent fourth stage of the PSLV rocket and it is equipped with solar panels as well uh, uh, solar panels and also lithium ion batteries navigation guidance and control systems etc and uh, communication capabilities as well so we see that there are all these things that we have as a part of this particular platform so this exposat mission this becomes very very crucial because this is the first dedicated scientific satellite from isro to carry out research in space based polarization measurements of x-ray emission from celestial sources that whatever x-rays are being emitted by various different celestial bodies that will be collected with the help of this exposat mission this is exactly what we want out of this particular mission but apart from that uh, the concept of POEM at the same time also becomes very very crucial it is something that was used for the first time in PSLV C53 mission back in 2022 where scientific experiment for this particular mission was carried out back then so overall uh, it deployed basically it was also deployed during the PSLV C30 uh, sorry C58 mission which carried nine payloads from various different organizations and institutions and all these payloads they conducted experiments and collected data during uh, the 400 orbits that it did around the earth now the significance of POEM3 it lies in its contributing contribution to the uh, mitigating of the space debris and promoting the space sustainability altogether so that's why it becomes very crucial from that perspective because uh, we know that space debris has become a very critical issue due to the increasing number of satellites and the space objects in the orbit and by safely deorbiting the fourth stage of the rocket and minimizing the risk of creating debris ISRO has demonstrated a proactive approach to space sustainability so that's why in the context of space debris the problem that we are seeing right now we see that this becomes a very very important approach being taken by India. Now lastly let's come to the main questions of the day. These are the two questions that we have. The first question discuss the environmental and socio-economic implications of rapid infrastructure development in the Himalayan region with specific reference to Ladakh. So we so environmental and socio-economic implications of the rapid infrastructure development. So we know that environmentally we, this is an area which is very fragile it will have a it may have a huge impact 
on the climate and not only of that particular area but the entire country and how it also has a negative impact on the economy and for the local communities how the things change and it can become very very difficult for example we already see that there is water scarcity in this area and the water consumption for the locals we have seen that already has decreased a lot and the pressure for consumption or, or availability of consumable water is increasing in these kind of areas because these are nothing but cold desert areas so you can't expect it to have a lot of resources or water specially available but unfortunately this is where the things are moving what are the key milestones and collaborative efforts that enabled the development and approval of next car 19 a made in india car c car t cell therapy and how do they reflect the broader landscape of cancer treatment innovation in developing countries so first as an introduction first talk about car t therapy and then the deviation from there what is the next car and then after that you can discuss about the various aspects of the therapy and how it can make uh, therapy affordable and what is the next step how we can reduce the cost further and all these are the things that can be mentioned in this particular answer so this brings us to the end of today's discussion i hope this was a fruitful discussion for you thank you very much for being here